Oh my God. <laughs> what's up? What's happening? On a Victory Monday. I mean, the Victory Monday of all Victory Mondays. It's the Hoffman Show. We're on the Team 980. We're always live as well on the free Odyssey app. We're streaming live on YouTube. And um, that really happened. Like, it's one of those things that you just enjoy uh, in the moment, no matter how you enjoyed it. And I look forward to hearing all the stories of how y'all enjoy that win over the next couple of days when we open up the phones. Um, and then you, you you watch all the reactions of everybody else and you see all the, the sideline videos and the locker room videos. And then you, you wake up the next morning. You're like, was that real? Did that really happened. Anthony, we were there. We saw it with our own two eyes. That really happened. I'm still in disbelief. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the postgame show, Logan looks at me and he goes, it was unbelievable. Is that fair to say? And I go, Logan, he ran around for 13 seconds and threw the ball 64 yards in the air. Of course it was unbelievable. Look, we'll do we'll do more hardcore analysis as the week goes because there's a lot in that game in the tape that I think is worth talking about. At least I presume. I haven't really had a chance to watch that much of it yet, if I'm being totally honest. Um, and honestly, today, today is not a tape day. We can have a full-on tape Tuesday as a show tomorrow. Today, today is about the vibes. Today is about the fact that we saw one of the coolest things we're ever going to see in our whole football lives. And so let's talk about it, and let's start with the first and ten. It's time to get the breakdown started. First up, 10 observations. It's first and 10. Number one. Whoa. Number two. Cool. Number three. Oh my. Okay, I'm not actually going to do that for all 10. It could have been fun, but we're not going to do that. Here's the real thing. Number one. That is the greatest thing that we will probably ever see in our football life, and it's pretty cool that everyone involved knew it. Jaden Daniels' appreciation for that moment after the game as a rookie in his first season going, I've never been a part of that, and if I never am again, like, it is what it is. That's pretty awesome perspective from a kid who seems to always have things in perspective. I feel bad, honestly, just saying that he's a kid because I do want to, like, in some ways, I want to say it, right? I want to remind everybody that Jaden Daniels is merely 23 years old. His maturity is so far advanced. His composure is so far advanced. And to think that it's somehow going to only grow, and honestly, if it doesn't, that's fine. He's mature enough and composed enough to operate in this league right now. But it's not just Jaden. It's the joy on Terry McLaurin's face. I had this really cool moment in the locker room where I was standing there with David Aldridge, and I, it's never lost on me as a kid who grew up watching the NBA on TNT, like who David is. And we're really lucky that he is in the second phase of his career, whatever phase this is, this current phase, that he is a local to us here in D.C. But he's still David freaking Aldridge. And so I'm standing there with the Hall of Famer, and it's me, D.A., Nick Allegretti, Tyler Biotish, Sam Cosme eventually comes over, and we're re-watching the play on David's phone. It's the first time those guys have seen it. And it was just a really cool moment to see the appreciation that all three of those, and frankly, all four of those, because David's covered a lot of stuff in his career, to see the appreciation that all of them had for it. Great, funny interaction with Allegretti talking about how on that play, he goes and cleans someone's clock. On the back end of that, the last block that's made that gives Jaden that extra little bit to really comfortably step into that throw and, and torque into it. And Nick's like, oh, I got him, but oh, man, his helmet hit me in the quad. Oh, that hurt like a mother. I'm just out here limping around like in his Chicago accent, which is extra great because they beat his childhood team and he was a big part of it. Just there's so many cool moments. DQ at the podium after talking about how that's the first time he's ever been a part of one of those. There's irony, and this part kind of sucks for, uh, you know, for Caleb Williams, but Caleb famously uh, at Gonzaga had that great Hail Mary. So maybe now his his association with the term Hail Mary in D.C. won't be quite as fun. But there, it, it's just, that doesn't happen. And there's, of course, some things that need to go right for it to happen. There's things that need to go wrong for it to happen. But... There's an element of luck. There's an element of skill and execution. You have to be in position to be lucky. And the fact that the commanders 
put themselves in position. They executed perfectly on that play. Zach Ertz making sure that there was a tip ball in the middle. Terry McLaurin. I don't even honestly know who the other receiver, probably Diami, maybe it was OZ. Whoever the other receiver was on the front side in case it was batted forward. And then Noah Brown on the back side, exactly where he's supposed to be. And thus the ball falls right to him. It's incredible. And I've seen those, by the way, hit receivers in the hands and get dropped before simply because it's so unexpected that it actually works. Terry told us in the locker room afterwards that they practice that drill, but they never practice it in a competitive setting. For all the things that they do competitive in this building, it's too risky that someone's going to get, you know, landed on or roll an ankle or, you know, guys are getting, you know, the million hands and feet all together. And so what they do is they practice it as a defensive drill and the defensive guys knock it down and the offensive guys don't really jump. They get out of the way. And then as an offensive drill, they the defense like gets in position, practices it, but then lets the offense catch it. It's just a safer way to practice all the positioning. And then your competitive spirit takes over in the moment. And they absolutely nailed it. And the pandemonium, the bedlam, um, I'll say our, our colleagues over at, at iHeart, uh, Bram and, and uh, Fletch, and obviously Logan, who, who is on the radio call uh, over there, and it works with us as well. Like those guys killed the radio call. I listened uh, a couple of minutes ago to the, the Spanish call. That was great. The Bears call is like so perfect. It just like, and they caught it. Oh my God. The Bears. And like the announcer wants to, like, doesn't even know what to do with themselves. Like, do I be sad? Do I be excited? Cause I just called this moment and like, this is a really cool football moment. But like, I'm calling it for the team. They just got their heart ripped out. A Nance's call on CBS was great. Any way you consumed that in person for us in the press box, um, I, I literally just jumped up out of my chair, full on. Uh, what's it, Anthony? What's it called? The the what cobra? The surrender cobra. But whatever the opposite of the surrender cobra is, the victory cobra. Just unbelievable. Hands on my head. Oh my god. Maniacally laughing because that happened, and then somehow it got sweeter. Number two. Because Tyreek Stevenson, who I don't want to go too hard here because he has already apologized and said, like, I really messed up. Buddy, you sure did. Tyreek Stevenson, who can get a little bit of smoke because he deserved it based off his chirp it all game, even though Terry smoked him on that double move, even though he got beat multiple times and, you know, he got bailed out by a pass rush or whatever. Like, it's not like he played a good game and he was yapping and he picked up the dumb penalty that Sam Cosme drew on him. Like, dude had a bad game and he's sitting there at the end after basically, like, I don't, that fourth quarter, like, we're going to have to figure out what happened there. But we can talk about that later. But that Bears defense, they're good. The hats off. Their second half performance was really good. And the, the commander's offense just gets tired, or the defense just gets tired by the end. And so there's Stevenson as the ball is being snapped. Full five seconds into the play. Yapping at fans. And then he's like, oh, I guess I better play football now. Goes up, tips the ball right to Noah Brown. It's his hand that doesn't. And there is just a poetic justice. Q. Kendrick Lamar. A poetic justice to that moment. That is... Wow. Chef's kiss. Beautiful. That's unlucky, though, if we're being honest. There is an element of bad luck to that. However, number three, there is perfect execution on Washington and horrendously bad football situational awareness by the Chicago Bears to get to that point. The commanders got the ball with 25 seconds left, right? That's when Chicago scored. It actually was less than that when they took their first snap. Why? Because... Uh, Austin Eckler had a legitimate kickoff return. Uh, the new rule probably helps Chicago there because typically uh, teams used to kick that out of the end zone. Now they're like, oh, it's too punitive. We want to make sure that he's farther back, so they pin it. It also kills off more time. Eckler gets a decent return, but it kills time in a major way. So then Washington, I mean, Jaden, that first play, throwing back across his body to Ertz when they didn't have to burn the timeout, that, that took a lot to not get a lot. Um, I mean, it got a nice chunk, and it obviously mattered. And it, I don't know if you, you realize this, but it all works out in the end. Uh, but, like, that wasn't ideal. The next play, the fact that the Bears let them get another 15 yards on an out with six seconds left, what are you doing? Jaden can throw a deep ball high and far, which is exactly what you want for a Hail Mary. And boy, did he when the time finally came. But he's not Anthony Richardson. He can't throw the ball 80 yards. 
Why are you giving them an extra 15 yards? Caleb Williams was apparently on the sideline yelling at Bears defenders, being like, what are you doing? And I, Matt Eberflus after the game was like, yeah, hey, yo, we were trying to prevent the touchdown. Yeah, you want to know how you prevent the touchdown? You don't let him in range to throw for the touchdown. And But, hey, credit to Terry. Great field awareness. Credit to Jaden. Rips the ball on the out accurately so Terry can catch it, continue running out of bounds, leads him perfectly. Terry nails the execution, and then obviously we saw what happened from there. But as DQ said afterwards, often in those moments, it's the plays before the play that set it up, and the commanders did basically everything textbook correct, and the Bears, they bared. Number four. It should be said that even though at the end, the Commanders had no business winning. The Bears had no business being in the lead in the first place. The Commanders outplayed the Bears thoroughly in this game. And they are a couple of calls and some better execution in some spots where they've been pretty good very often this year from winning this game in a blood. This game could have easily been 28 nothing in the third quarter. Like, the, the lack of red zone execution, sad. There, some of that is completely self-inflicted with penalties and such. They had two touchdowns called off the board. Both correct calls, by the way. It should be said, even though the, the Allegretti downfield one is tight and the Ertz one, I know for some reason people didn't think that that was the correct call. It very much easily was. Like, that ball's moving uh, as Ertz hits the ground. His hand is kind of underneath it, but the ball is on the ground as well, and it is moving before he scoops it back up off the ground. Like, he doesn't survive the ground on the catch. That is a very easy call, but it's so close, and he makes that catch probably, I don't know, seven times out of ten. It just happened to be one of the three that he didn't. Tough one, but that's Zach Ertz. He makes plays like that. So you have two touchdowns called uh, off the board. You have, on the first drive of the game, uh, Luke McCaffrey is wide open, and Jaden is rushed just enough by Montez Sweat that he has to, he can't get like set his feet and get anything on the ball and the DB is able to get back. But McCaffrey is butt naked open on that third and two. Ultimately, they kick a field goal. Also, there's the wacky bit where Seibert kicks the ground. Um, and so, otherwise, you're probably at a tie game anyway. And maybe we go, we go to overtime and we don't get a Hail Mary situation. Um, but, like, down in, down out, the Commanders were the better football team. And that should be said. I will have a better feel for that once I get through all of the tape. Uh, Logan and I record tomorrow morning on Take Command. So if you want to subscribe to Take Command, that's the first place you'll be able to hear that. I will obviously talk about it more on the radio show tomorrow. But, like, yes, the Hail Mary is unlikely. And when a team wins on that unlikely of a situation, then it is it, it feels like a lucky win. This was the proper outcome. Because the Bears' defense is good. They played really well in the second half. Their offense is a nightmare, as we're going to talk about as we go here. But they, they, the Bears, were not the better team that all of a sudden got robbed at the end by a lucky play. The Bears were lucky to be in that thing in the first place. You can make, you know, Washington is kind of lucky in the fourth quarter because also why the hell are the Bears handing the ball to a backup offensive lineman on a fullback dive and, and you know, washing away a, a touchdown? I don't know, but... All in all, like that that touchdown that should have been there should have also made it like 28-14. And Washington could have very easily, based off of the flow and the down-in, down-out execution, won this game 40-10. to That just real talk. Number five. The reason they didn't is because they couldn't finish. And that's not good enough. And especially for a team that, pre that preaches finishing in the way that they do. They're 0-3 in the red zone, 5-15 of on third down. Four penalties by the offensive line, including two illegal man downfield calls that brought back big plays, one of which brought back the OZ touchdown. It's not good enough against better teams. And part of that is when you play better teams and the Bears are better than some of the teams that Washington has faced, you're under more pressure. It's harder to not hold because the guy across from you is faster and, and some of that. So that's why it's, you know, hey, like, ah, you get a little jumpy because I got I to gotta make sure my kick set is good against Montez Sweat because he's really good. But at the end of the day, like, don't jump off sides. Don't get downfield when there's no, you're not even involved in the play. So there's there's stuff like that that if they can just clean up the execution, they turn back into the 30-point team instead of a team that got 18 thanks to a Hail Mary at the end. Number six. Something else that I really want to double-click on as I watch the tape this week and something that Logan and I are going to definitely spend some time on on Take Command is what happened to the run game after the first drive? Um, on the first drive, B-Rob had five carries for 35 yards. That's seven yards per carry. He was killing it. 
and they ran a bunch of different runs. There's GT pulls, so guard tackles pulling around. They had one play where, like, Luke McCaffrey kind of comes back across the formation and uh, wham blocks somebody. And you're like, oh, we're sending wide receivers to do this stuff now to cut off backside defensive ends? That's a bold move, Cliff. Worked out. They ran stuff with fullbacks. They ran stuff with multiple tight ends. They ran stuff with no tight ends. Like, they, their run game is so varied. They had Jaden pull one on the first drive and get nine yards. So they just ran the ball down Chicago's throat and then stalled out in the red zone um, in part because of one negative carry and then the miss, good rush by Montez, that Jaden's able to get a ball off. But Luke, if he's, I don't know, an inch taller and can keep a, a, a toe down, like it was so close to a touchdown. But then the rest of the game, 15 carries for 30 yards. So he got some opportunities, but it, it definitely felt as if the as as the game went, the game got away from Brian Robinson, and they fa- didn't have ways to fit that. Their second level, Chicago's second level defenders were really fast and, and fit runs really well. So you got to give credit to the Bears there, um, and then Eckler too. It's not like they got him going, you know. And, and you got to credit Chicago on that because Eckler was the guy that I thought might kill them in this game because they have been really bad at giving up explosive runs. And outside of the 29-yard meaningless carry when Dan Quinn didn't call the Hail Mary at the end of the first half, Eckler only has six carries for 23 yards the rest of the game. So all in all, the running game for Washington was done by volume, done by Jaden scrambles, and a couple of key points in the game that allowed them to, to get some production that looks good on the stat sheet. But realistically, it was not a great rushing performance, and I really want to do a better job of understanding why. Number seven. Um, Terry McLaurin has been unbelievable this year, and especially as of late. And I would just like to highlight for a moment his greatness. Because we've always known Terry's an elite player in this league. Uh, maybe not a top five guy, but he's, he's to me a top ten receiver in this league. And he's had to deal with so many different quarterbacks. And he has continued to just put up thousand-yard season after thousand-yard season after thousand-yard season in this league. And... All of a sudden, you get him a real dude. You get him a real great quarterback. You get him a play caller who understands, and it took a few weeks, but understands how to get him the football and let him be dangerous, where he's reliable, how to get him unlocked deep. And since week two, where Terry Terry had uh, two catches on four targets in the opener, against the Giants, they attempted to get him the ball. It just didn't go great. He was six catches uh, for 22 yards. Since then, he has had 52 yards and 53 yards in in a couple games. And the other four games are 100, 112, 98, 125. So in his last one, two, three, four, five, six games, he's over 100 yards three times, has 98 yards another time. That's ridiculously good production. That is some serious high-level ball. And in the 5 for 125 and the way that he got it on Sunday, big plays, big chunks, key catches from the first half all the way down to the play before the Hail Mary, that threat of taking the top off the defense has opened up the offense for guys like Zach Ertz over the middle who just continues to be open almost whenever Jaden needs him. And that combination with the running game and Jaden's running element is why I don't think that there's a great solution against this team. Again, Washington stopped itself on some level in the red zone. Their offense down in, down out was still really good in this game. I mean, Jaden had almost 400 yards of offense by himself. So I I do think that they need to continue to mature and score more consistently uh, in some of these tougher games. But I, I think they're like a legitimately phenomenal offense and Terry is playing a huge, huge part in that. Um, on the other side of the ball, number eight, uh, Joe Witt Jr. had Caleb in an absolute blender. And I'll talk more about Williams in a second. But Witt in this game, the pressure calls, the simulated pressures, the the different matchups that they chose, holy crap, man. Uh, they had 25 pressures in this game, according to PFF. Johnny Newton had seven. 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 For Johnny uh, Newton, he played 18 snaps against the pass. Three hits, three hurries, had a sack. Um, Jalen Holmes gets on the board in this game. Luvu obviously had Williams dead to rights a couple times. They got pressure on 61% of Williams' dropbacks. 61%. Now, Caleb did an unbelievable job of avoiding sacks. 
Um, the the Newton one off the botched screen is, I think, the only one that officially or that that goes down as a sack. Yeah. Oh uh, uh, no, they 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 gave two more. Uh, yeah, Holmes had the one, and then Duran had one. Um, but mostly Caleb was able to get out. So it's 22 times there's pressure and no sack. But if that's not Caleb or Jaden or Pat Mahomes or Lamar, that's a 5 to 10 to 12 sack performance from that D-line. And how on it Joe Witt was was fantastic. And now they just obviously need to finish better, which is hard, but but needs to happen. Two Bears notes. Number 9. Caleb Williams made some of the sickest throws that I've ever seen in my entire life in that fourth quarter. And if he can figure out how to play on schedule and continue to make chicken salad when the the play gives him chicken you-know-what, instead of sometimes creating his own problems and being out of rhythm and then having to play off structure, he is going to live up to the hype that he had going into this. And he will go down as one of the all-time greats. That's not a comparison to Jaden. They both might wind up in the Hall of Fame. Like, that's how talented Caleb is. That's how ridiculously good Jaden has been. And we are seven, eight games into this. So I'm not trying to get too far out over the skis, but I'm just telling you that like watching Caleb Williams operate, the liveliness of his arm, some of the plays he makes off schedule, that dude is nasty. And he is in a bad situation on offense. I hate what they are doing to him offensively, and I hate what they did in this game. And the fact that it came off a bye is kind of frankly embarrassing. He had a miserable day through three and a half quarters at 36 yards going into the last couple of drives. And then he made some stuff happen and it was Mahomesian. And I do not say Mahomesian lightly, but that is to say for the DC kid, Caleb Williams, he's going to be all right. I wouldn't want him over Jaden Daniels right now. I don't know that I'd want him over Jaden Daniels for the future. That's about Jaden. Caleb, that dude's good, but he's not the best player that uh, is on his team, and he's not the best player that, that the Chicago Bears drafted this year. Number 10. No, that is the punter. I got to look. Hold on. I need to look up his name because he deserves respect. Um, the Bears punter is the best punter I've ever seen. Tory Taylor. This dude was on one yesterday. Washington started. Uh, Sam Fortier uh, gets the credit here uh, for looking this up. Washington started five drives at or inside its own nine-yard line. You can't play a field position game when the other punter just automatically, you lose. And, and Washington has trust way. Since 2000, that's only happened 10 times. Five drives at or inside your own nine-yard line. And uh, to Sam's point, one reason uh, that the commanders had a tough time finishing drives is because they had to go so freaking far to get where they were going. Kid, Tory Townsend, you're really good at kicking. Or sorry, Tory Taylor. My bad. You deserve better than that. Tory Taylor, you're really good at punting footballs. You're the best player on the Bears. And I don't mean that as a shot at any other player on the Bears. Tressway was the best player on this team for a long time. Oh my God. What a weapon that dude is. Unfortunately for the Bears, he was called upon a lot yesterday. And uh, yeah, good job. Good job, punter man. Okay, that's, that's first and 10, everybody. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.